Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about IKEA's approach to reaching more for the many. Uh, the topic is segmentation and customer meeting points in core markets. Uh, my name is Michael Shida. I'm the Business Development Director for Enveronics Analytics, supporting our retail, real estate, and restaurant clients. I'm relatively new to the organization, having spent uh, having started in May of 2021. I spent the better part of 15 years working in various roles, supporting real estate and marketing for some of Canada's largest grocers, home improvement chains, and financial institutions. Uh, despite the crossover between various industries, the one constant in my life is that I've uh, always been working with EA data to make informed decisions uh, and decision making when it comes to real estate and marketing decisions. Uh, so I'm going to pass it off to Daniel to give his introduction, but we're super excited to have him here with us today. So thank you, Daniel. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, excited to be here as well. So um, a quick word about my, my professional journey. So I've kind of oscillated between uh, brand management and market research, but I've kind of stuck to marketing uh, for the entirety of my career. Um, and I have uh, had an opportunity to work across several markets as well. So I've worked in the US, um, in Pakistan, and now uh, in Canada. Um, I worked fortunately on both the client and the agency side um, and with several several brands um, and across multiple categories. So I've worked in the CPG space, um, in, in technology, in finance, and now of course excited to be a part of the home furnishing space. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so from an agenda perspective, uh, we're gonna give you a high level overview of IKEA. We're gonna talk about uh, the current situation in Canada uh, what does affordability look like to everyone? And what is the size uh, of the prize from a consumer opportunity perspective? And then finally, we're going to review uh, how IKEA is planning their new store formats and what exactly that means for some of their downtown Toronto real estate. So Daniel, off to you. Thanks again. So a bit about IKEA. Um, I, most of the information is up there anyway, uh, but just some interesting numbers uh, that will help uh, give us some perspective on where we are uh, in our journey at IKEA Canada. So IKEA started from this small town pronounced Emold. I know we're all, we all struggle with our Swedish pronunciations uh, with Emold, uh, which is a town in small land in southern Sweden. And to give you some perspective, the town has about 9,000 inhabitants. And if you compare that uh, to IKEA's 150,000 co-workers globally, I think even if we try fitting all the people working for IKEA in the, door, in the town, it'll be a bit of a, a tough ask. Um, so IKEA has definitely come a long way globally. If we come to the Canadian market specifically, we have been around for around for more than 45 years. And I, I think as each year passes, IKEA Canada is striving to be even more affordable, even more accessible, and even more sustainable. Um, and we're trying to do that by increasing our customer meeting points or touch points and really strengthen um, our omni-channel uh, customer experience, um, trying to provide a seamless journey across all touch points. Um, so we have a few numbers uh, on the screen, but essentially uh, giving an idea of our footprint. So we have 14 full-size stores um, in IKEA. G generally, the full size was the only size, but uh, we've we are expanding our customer meeting points um, in order to meet the customer in more innovative ways. So we have um, we have an upcoming downtown store. We have a design studio up now, um, and we will we'll get into the specifics of this. Uh, but I'll stop myself there and give it back to Mike uh, before we dive into some of the specifics. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. So, what does affordability look like in Canada? So, we started this whole process by reviewing affordability from a national perspective. While the incomes of Canadians are steadily increasing, there's still two thirds of the population that are still making under $100,000. While the average household income is $109,000, 78% of that, or nearly $85,000, is what people actually bring home after taxes. After they pay for life's necessities, they have roughly $59,000 to spend on everything else in their life. Expenditure and furnishing and household equipment accounts for nearly 7% of that, or $55 billion. Um, so Daniel, question for you, actually two questions for you. What were the surprises that you came across uh, as you started to look through disposable income and discretionary income across Canada? And we're obviously showing a subset of some of the data that we looked at, 
but was there specific data points or data points of interest that proved to be very valuable to the organization? Uh, thanks, thanks again, Mike. Uh, so I'd say from a surprises uh, point of view, they were not. Uh, I think given our emphasis on affordability and how much we value it in the organization, we are constantly keeping a pulse on, on how these numbers are progressing and, and what Canadians at the moment can afford um, and cannot afford. Um, so we're definitely very familiar with these numbers. Um, in terms of uh, data points, um, I'd say looking at these numbers as well, um, I, I think one, one interesting number that sticks out, um, especially if you if we hone into the average discretionary income and look at what's being spent uh, at within the home furnishing space, which is give or take 7%. And if you really break that number down, you're looking at around $300 to $400, de uh, depending on, on various estimates in terms of the monthly spend um, of, of each of those consumers in the home furnishing space. Um, so that's what we want an increasing share of that wallet as we uh, penetrate in the Canadian market. Um, and overall, the market, the opportunity size in the market is massive. So it's a, it's a $54 billion market from a consumer spending perspective. And given that it's only 50% of it uh, that's dominated by, by some of the bigger players and the rest is mostly an amalgamation of smaller regional local players, the growth opportunity is, is enormous. Uh, um, so, so yeah, so I think given that and how much the Canadians are spending with us is, um, I'd say those are some of the interesting data points that we're closely looking at, uh, closely looking at as, we're, um, as we're expanding. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess um, I didn't realize as we went through this exercise, I didn't realize how fragmented um, uh, the Canadian economy is, at least from a, a home furnishings perspective. So until you truly understand what the size of the pie you're fighting for is, I think uh, it, it's tough to say where you go from here and what your growth opportunities are. So thank you for that. Um, but as, as we kind of evolved this exercise and we went through it, we also uh, took a look at financial vulnerability across Canada. Unique to EA, the vulnerability index is a measure of sensitivity in the markets to sudden uh, income shifts or economic shifts or changes. The higher the index, the more vulnerable a market is uh, to, uh, to income shifts. The lower the index, the less sensitive a market would be uh, in the economy. We attempted to lay the groundwork for understanding what some of the regional nuances are and building out a storyline for what is affordable in Canada. As an example, if we look at Atlantic Canada and Quebec regions, there seems to be much more vulnerability in those areas to economic shifts than any other Canadian region across Canada. To a certain degree, as a retailer, I think this must be a vital piece of information for you to have as you start thinking about new real estate and how to potentially market to these customers. Is there a strategy at IKEA for deeply penetrating and serving these areas uh, that experience more financial vulnerability? Uh, I was, for a minute, I was just thinking if you say no. That would have been an, an interesting headline as well. <laughs> Session um, over. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> we do. Um, we we certainly do, and I think um, we are definitely cognizant of the impact of COVID, as as everybody else is, and how how Canadians are facing increasingly uh, hard times from a financial perspective. Um, even if looking at some of the numbers, given that. 41% um, of the Canadian workforce has experienced employment loss or reduction of work um, and lower discretionary income and uncertainty surrounding the future and duration of COVID-19 um, means that people are increasingly more cautious about their spending as well. Um, and I think even, uh, even if we take a step back and go before the pandemic era, um, Canada's biggest cities, including Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, uh, were and still are amongst uh, some of the most unaffordable cities in the world um, with extremely expensive housing. So uh, given, given all that, uh, and of course with, with COVID, um, we're committed to keeping prices low enough uh, that as many people as possible can afford them. And by producing in, in high volumes with uh, smarter designs and of course our, our flat packaging, uh, we are able to keep our costs down um, and hence pass these savings directly on to our customers. Um, and every year, it's, it's a continuous process as we evolve our understanding of our customers and consumers as well. We are reinvesting um, so we can continue that low price journey um, for our core IKEA products. And uh, 
are generally, I, I think it's not, while that, that price is um, as affordable as we can make it, um, the idea is also to be able to provide well-designed, functional uh, home furnishing products. So it's, it's just overall great value for money. Um, and our quality is as important as our affordability is. Um, so both these and, and, and a, a functional design is really at the core um, of, our, of our strategy as well. Um, and I think as I'm, um, I'm going about this, this strategy is not necessarily uh, inward facing in the sense that we are constantly keeping uh, a pulse check on how our consumers are thinking. So whether that's our research and insights gathered around a Canadian's life at home, uh, which is a critical part for us uh, and how we understand how consumers are actually living in their day to day. Um, so it's, it's coupled with that incoming data and understanding of the market um, that we are able to understand and understand our customers' needs, um, their aspirations, and then provide solutions for their frustration and challenges, uh, including the existing ongoing uh, struggle to make ends meet. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like uh, certainly a, a little bit for everybody, depending on where you are in your life stage. And uh, for sure, an evolving process as you kind of go through this exercise. Um, so after reviewing, uh, reviewing affordability in Canada, we set out to better understand where the growth opportunities might lie. Uh, in doing so, we took a look at segmentation. Uh, so why exactly is this relevant and important to IKEA? So using IKEA customer data, we were able to segment their customer base to see areas of the population where they might be doing particularly well. Subsequently, we were also able to identify some additional customer groups where growth opportunities might lie. Having this information better enables IKEA to roll out store concepts with the right product assortment, the right message, and the ideal location that speaks to the new customers and what they might be trying to better in areas they might be trying to better, better penetrate. So Daniel will walk you through the application of segments uh, uh, from I an IKEA context in the next few slides. Perfect. Um, thanks again, Mike. So I, I think it's um, given our um, our discussion, ongoing discussion around how we're aspiring to reach more and more customers. Um, I think it's almost impossible for any company to call itself customer centric and then be oblivious to its customer needs and preferences. Um, and segmentation is one such step in that direction. Um, we should also, however, be mindful that it is a dynamic exercise. The exercise needs to be refreshed. Um, and while the, the jury is out on, on after how long the, uh, it, it should be, uh, the process should be repeated, um, at IKEA, we felt that it was about time where we revisit our segmentation strategy and tweak it to uh, adjust it with the evolving and existing uh, consumer needs as well, particularly, of course, after, after the pandemic. Um, so our objective was, was fairly clear from the onset. We wanted to reach more of the many. Um, what in, in terms of metrics, it, it essentially translated into just higher penetration uh, for IKEA. So we, um, we started that journey with, with Environics in terms of first defining what the market is, what the affordability landscape looks like, um, personifying those segments and bringing them to life. And some of those that you see on screen here as well, um, in terms of what uh, proportion of the overall market they represent. Um, and then deploying our, our strategy in line with, uh, with some, of, um, some of these segments. Um, and we, we, have, we don't have the exact data here, um, but just essentially uh, materializing our strategy. And then finally, I think to close the loop and the, one of the most important pieces to constantly measure um, our progress against those segments as well and how we move it along. So if we, if we go forward, we'll, um, we'll see another application of that. And I, and I think there, there perhaps is general agreement that the best insight work happens when we kind of join forces and ingest internal data with external data to observe needs. So this slide is a, is a perfect example of that where we have tried to merge our first party data with, uh, with the, the, the data that Environics has to, to come up with learnings that could, again, uh, help us uh, along our segmentation journey. And without getting into the specifics here, but um, again, what, what we would typically see is different segments 
um, could be talked to in different means. Um, and as we continue on our omnichannel journey and providing customers with a seamless experience across all those touch points, it's important for us to know how to best reach our segments um, and what are some of those channels that we need to prioritize and how does our understanding of that segment from one channel defer to another. So this is just an example of that, of how we are mindful of uh, which segments to reach through which channels and how to tie in uh, that omnichannel experience with the other uh, channels as well. Again, leveraging our own data and then um, environics data as well in terms of enhancing that understanding. And then if we, if we go, go forward, um, we, we just, again, building on that narrative, we are able to see um, what's in it for us in terms of the market potential uh, versus penetration. So uh, we are really able to see which are the segments that we need um, to protect, which are the segments that we need to grow um, if we are to, again, further uh, our penetration numbers there as, there as well. One important call out that's important here is that, of course, and uh, most of the insight professionals will agree that any segmentation exercise um, does not imply that we're alienating the other segments. It's more around enhancing our understanding uh, for the segments that matter most to us, especially from a market potential versus penetration perspective. And what are some of the opportunity areas that we can we can uh, improve upon? And then, if we go one step further, so this was a national understanding of how. It'll vary, and this is just one example of how then we'll be taking that national learning and applying it on a local market level to see um, how some segments, of course, are more important than other segments depending on the market. Um, and of, of course, we live in an extremely diverse um, country where there are different pockets. So we, we also are cognizant of how those sizes and those market potential and penetration rates fluctuate uh, in different markets as well. So this is just one example and one comparison point of national versus market. Um, and we are really trying to localize our offerings, whether that's our range um, or our marketing efforts as well. So we are able to speak to the segments in the markets, um, depending on, on the dynamics of that particular market as well. Um, and I think that's a, that's, a good segue into speaking about how we've kind of leveraged um, all these insights uh, and how that has helped us navigate our entry into the Toronto downtown space with some new um, store formats and real estate after, uh, real estate implications for that. So broadly, we've had two uh, avenues of expansion. So we have an upcoming downtown store. If you haven't read about it in the news already, there's a lot of, lot of coverage around that. And it's uh, it really is IKEA, uh, uh, as part of IKEA's efforts as we continue to transform our business to be more accessible. Uh, globally, IKEA has already opened 10 small um, IKEA stores in major cities like Paris, Moscow, Shanghai, um, and most recently in New York as well. Um, and the new downtown location in Toronto will be, of course, highly connected with the, the, uh, the downtown young area. Um, it'll be, uh, again, affordable and accessible destination for our downtown residents looking for the IKEA experience closer to home. So we don't have to travel to uh, what um, some um, downtown residents would consider the outskirts, which, which really are still part of the Toronto city. But um, if you don't venture, that further up north or west. Um, so it's really, really an opportunity for all the downtown consumers to, uh, to get IKEA within, within a walking distance. Um, and then there's a, it's a similar idea with, with the design studios as well, um, as it's, it's just one of the many ways we're enabling our customers to interact seamlessly with IKEA. So it's the IKEA design studio in a nutshell, it's significantly smaller than a traditional IKEA store. Um, and will showcase a part of the IKEA range through digital solutions, uh, along with a small curated collection of product samples on display. Um, so again, it's a private space for customers to connect with our expert planners um, and create personalized home furnishing packages. Uh, and we do realize the need of, of hyper-personalization in today's world and with our customers as well. 
Um, so, and, and that's again, in a, a step in, in that direction. And I will pass it back to Mike with that long monologue. <laughs> it's quite all right. I mean, having had a retail background myself, uh, it's certainly exciting to hear when, when retailers are expanding. And it's even more exciting when, when you hear that they're expanding and uh, taking on new real estate and new formats, uh, certainly in, uh, in this era of COVID, uh, when so many retailers have gone in the opposite direction. So uh, certainly exciting news for IKEA. So you have your, your downtown IKEA location uh, in the Aura building that's expected to open up in 2022, uh, significantly smaller, as you had mentioned, at 66,000 square feet. So pales in comparison to your 200,000 square foot plus stores that, that we're all familiar with. And then you have your stacked IKEA downtown studio, which is in the container district uh, in more of uh, uh, Western downtown Toronto. Uh, so I think once we knew that we had, uh, once we knew that IKEA had these sites in mind, obviously uh, a next logical step was defining a trade area. Uh, knowing the size and shape of the trade area is an extremely important uh, step in this process because it essentially allows us to give us measurement um, in, in the number of customers that we think you're going to get, obviously in their demographics and what their exact spending potential might be. Uh, so how do we create these trade areas? Uh, using mobile movement data, uh, we were able to better understand traffic and movement patterns within the trade areas. And we created a trade area that accounted for 60% of visits over a two year time frame uh, that were already going to these locations, uh, given that they were already uh, existing locations in downtown uh, Toronto. So Daniel, I'm gonna pass it to you to talk about the, the target groups um, and what their presence is within the market. Absolutely. Um, and I think I, I won't take too much time here, but essentially this and the next slide, and we're talking about uh, maps, I think it's absolutely critical when we're, especially from a, from a retail perspective, especially when we're going down the segmentation road and looking at different segments and different markets um, in terms of how that informs um, our real estate choices and expansion opportunities and where we uh, are and how to kind of inform everything about that location. So when we are obviously talking about our downtown store or whether that was a design studio pop-up in stack, um, it, it definitely helps to know what segment is the most penetrated in that particular vicinity. So we can then cater to that segment's needs accordingly, whether that's from a range perspective um, or otherwise, and then really um, honing in on that particular segment and, and their needs. So that this slide is, is the, the perfect encapsulation of that idea as to how some, some segments would vary depending on the trade area in question. And if we go in the next slide, which is a further zoom in of the, um, the more of the core market that we are trying to see, you, you start to see um, a, a pattern emerge and in, in terms of how one segment is definitely stronger in this particular region versus other and these are exactly the kind of patterns that we're looking for um, from a retail perspective. And these maps, um, when we have a cross section of this with our understanding of segments, really give us the ability uh, to localize our offering, um, speaking to that one particular segment. Again, not alienating the others, but just enhancing um, our understanding of the, of the segment that matters. Mike, I think you're yeah. muted. Yeah, sorry about that. So I think one of the cool things we, we, we took a look at is, I'm not going to steal your thunder and, and talk about sustainability because I know you're going to do it in, in the next couple of slides, but knowing that sustainability is, um, is an important mandate within IKEA, I think one of the really cool things we looked at as we kind of went down this process is just better understanding of, of, of the type of behaviors that live within kind of the trade area. So knowing that uh, secondhand purchases, both from Ikea and Kijiji are really prominent within the trader. I think that gives you kind of a firm understanding on how you think of what decide, what you choose to decide what goes into the store and what might not go into the store. Uh, I know in some of your larger locations, you have a circular location where you have, have an opportunity to sell some, some secondhand furniture. But I think this gives you a good understanding of exactly who is living in that trader and what their behaviors might be. And subsequently, I know we also looked at uh, what some of the restaurant preferences might be. So please tell me, knowing that Japanese food over indexes in the in the in the downtown city trade area, are you going to be having uh, Japanese food in, in the food court there? Um, <laughs> we, I think, at least from a co-worker's perspective, I have my fingers crossed for that one, and I'm trying to lobby our internal food teams to do that. 
<laughs> Nothing against salmon or Swedish maple, but uh, I think Japanese might be a, a hot commodity as uh, as you start to think through some of these decisions. <laughs> So another step that we kind of took in this process is we took a comparative view of the trade area of the newly proposed site and the existing stores within your network. I think there was some pretty compelling figures as we went through this. While population growth, household income, and visible minority remain in line with other trade areas in the region, uh, commuting via by car is super low, obviously no surprise there. And I think that aligns really well with some of your sustainability initiatives and missions. Um, it also does position it quite so quite well with the proposed in-stock offering, knowing uh, that you're likely probably not going to be uh, have a ton of customers taking home a big, uh, a larger type furniture. I think it gives you an opportunity to potentially have some of maybe those smaller accessories and take home items within the store. We also later layered in uh, eco living, which is a measurement of how customers in the trade area integrate environmental concerns into their purchasing criteria. Without a doubt, the two downtown locations, uh, so your stacked and your aura building, uh, they certainly have the highest measurement of, uh, of eco living value within all the trade areas uh, that we took a look at in the region. So on that, I'm going to pass it to you. Uh, I know talking about sustainability, I know IKEA has taken on a fairly ambitious uh, plan over the next 10 years. I've heard the mantra thrown around a few times that people just don't want better value in products. They also demand better business. Um, could you take a minute or two and talk about IKEA's sustainability mandate globally and maybe some of the Canadian initiatives and what exactly that means uh, for your existing and new real estate? Absolutely. Uh, and just a, um, a disclaimer, I, I don't think I'll be able to do justice to it, but I'll try my best to speak to uh, towards fair, some of our fair. sustainability <laughs> initiatives. But um, yes, I, I think some of the metrics that you were alluding to are exactly um, uh, some of the data that we're looking to see uh, and on how to kind of appeal to that eco-conscious consumer segment as well um, on a more micro level. And I think on, if you take a step back and look at it from a macro perspective, it's, it's absolutely no secret that the world is facing a climate crisis that is worsening inequalities all around the world. We had the recent um, UN climate change conference as well. We, we saw a lot of initiatives coming out of that, particularly um, IKEA's role in that conference and how we are really trying to put our money where our mouth is in terms of pushing the needle on sustainability. Um, I, I think that, again, the planet we, we all share needs us now more than ever um, to ensure that it remains a home uh, for generations to come. And that's why we've really decided to go all in on sustainability um, at IKEA globally and at IKEA Canada as well. Um, and, and some of the initiatives that you see on screen um, contain countless examples of local, local efforts where we've pushed the sustainability narrative in Canada. And whether that's uh, making our entire lighting range to LED um, or our plant-based meatballs um, that only have 4% of the climate footprint of our um, Swedish meatballs. Um, our circularity program that you, you refer to as well, where we give furniture a second life or um, it's our goal that by 2025 to have 100% of our home deliveries across Canada to be made by uh, electric vehicles or other zero emission uh, transportation uh, to kind of uh, support the transition away uh, from our fossil fuel dependency. So I think all of this uh, ties into our, our real estate decisions on, on our expansion opportunities a store in downtown, for instance, really caters to the environmentally conscious segment in Toronto by allowing consumers to, for instance, to reach us through public transit. And it's, it's these small steps um, along with the bigger ones. Um, and all these decisions come together um, to kind of help us uh, push the needle on our drive for sustainability. Yeah, the transit point, that's, that's, that's something we hadn't mentioned. That's a great point. Um, so. Uh, on that, uh, moving over to uh, expenditures. Uh, so using data from our household uh, spend survey, we also took a look at expenditures by home furnishing, home furnishing and accessory categories. This gives us the expenditure potential by households and total area for any given geography. Um, Daniel, without giving in away any uh, sworn trade, trade secrets, knowing that like household accessories and decor over index the population by a wide margin while cooking appliances under index 
How would this type of information drive a decision on your product assortment uh, for store planning for um, for city center, as an example? Um, yeah, and I, I think that's a, that's a great example in terms of uh, where we need to strike that balance, where we are constricted for space. So as you said, we don't have the luxury of fitting everything IKEA has to offer. Um, and we need to make choices and we need to make decisions of what we need to prioritize versus others. So again, fitting as many appliances in a downtown store and we are not expecting our consumers to walk out with those. Um, so I think those are some of the, the data points that help us inform how we can, again, target to that specific segment that we saw in, in one of the maps earlier, um, how we can speak to them better from a range perspective. For sure, absolutely. So I think one of the cool things we did kind of as we went down this road is um, we took uh, using the same data that we used to establish the trade areas, uh, we could also see how customers patronized other locations using our cross shop tool. Uh, and it actually demonstrated some really high numbers from an industry perspective. These are percentages that we really don't see elsewhere when we start looking at uh, uh, potentially some other retailers. It's a really, really high rate of cross shop among uh, IKEA stores. Um, what this tells me is that there's super high brand awareness uh, within the city center trade area uh, with nearly 40% of the customers already visiting one of the nearby IKEAs uh, in, in the greater Toronto area. Um, Daniel, when you see numbers like this, uh, it being so high uh, that people are already visiting IKEA, um, uh, do you consider this cannibalistic, can, cannibalistic at all? Or do you see this as acquiring just a, just deeply, more deeply penetrating your existing customer base? Yes, I, I think I'll go back to one of the earlier numbers in terms of the overall home furnishing opportunity. Um, for us, it's really diving down on that um, and trying to increase our share of wallet. Um, so for cannibalizing one of our locations or the other is, is, um, is secondary to us and in more so in terms of how we can reach more of the many um, so as long as we're capitalizing on that 60% number of people who are not already shopping at Ikea, um, we're, we're not too concerned about capitalizing. Yeah, that's a fair point for sure. So um, when we've reviewed housing and income structure of the trade area, we see a high or a strong proportion of the high rise apartments and construction uh, built five to 10 years ago. How would data like this typically drive uh, some of your formats and your product offering? So I, just a quick example, uh, and I, I know we're also also want to leave enough time for question and answers, but um, so things like um, depending on the age of the house, uh, it would help us inform um, when the renovations are most likely, which segment would be looking for them, um, and then we can reach out to those consumers accordingly. Um, the, the older the, whole, uh, the house, the more likely it is that the people would be planning renovations, so then we can have our teams um, prepare for that accordingly and reach out to those consumers. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, before I end off, Daniel, I love uh, chatting with you. IKEA is one of my favorite retailers, both inside and outside the workplace. Uh, but I just want to kind of summarize what we, uh, uh, the overarching theme of, of, of this presentation. So I think what we learned is rely on fact-based data to evaluate real estate decisions. Having a deep understanding of market sizing data, demographic expenditure, and behaviors can all aid in your decision-making ability. Uh, gain a deeper insights into your customers will help you drive loyalty. Um, increasing the trend of customers shopping with values. Uh, this is an increasing trend that we're seeing all over the place. So customers are demanding uh, more accountability from, from the businesses. Uh, they're also shopping uh, more with kind of their values in mind and that kind of ties back to some of your sustainability and your eco living. Um, developing a consistent view of your markets and your stored trade area will help you be better drive uh, some of your decision-making ability. And then of course, using mobile movement data can assist in understanding and creating trade areas, cross shop opportunities and brand awareness of an area. Um, so that essentially uh, uh, draws a close to the presentation. Daniel, I wanna thank you again. Uh, like I mentioned before, I, I always love chatting with you. Uh, Every time we have one of these chats, uh, I always learn something new about IKEA and, and you personally. So uh, thank you uh, so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, I was just, yeah, I was just uh, worried about that. We'll probably just keep going on and on. We could make this into a, a, an hour chat easily for sure. <laughs> yes, yes. But thanks again for, uh, for having me and allowing me an opportunity to talk about IKEA.
Yeah, it was a pleasure. I do want to uh, encourage everybody to stay on. I know there is a Q&A to follow. Uh, so please stay on and uh, hit both Daniel and I with those hard-hitting questions and we'd be more than happy to answer. So thank you again. Absolutely.